No, 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 no. How can I get to yeah. toolbar? Um, just unshare it. Let's let's unshare the screen. Okay, let's mm -hmm. share again. We share the whole desktop. Um, is it desktop two? You should be that one desktop as well. Oh. Yeah, now it's coming. Around. <laughs> Let's swap it around. Oh, so swap okay. it. So, uh, into... oh, they can't be. Oh, uh... Yeah, it's the other. How to work. maybe uh, go to, to mirror displays? I don't think it's going to be that. Oh, so that's the one way around. So I think you might have to go to settings to do this. Uh, where are we? The site is not great with settings. Ah, here we are. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, that's not it. Is it streams I'm looking for? Uh, let me oh, start this one. Uh, how to? Yeah, this is good now. This is good now. Oh, that's good. Yeah. It's great. It's sharing. Yeah, I can see on the screen. Yeah. Okay. You want to hide the floating control? Oh, but something. it's actually. I need to see my notes here. It's it's it's, uh, it's mirroring. I need to see my uh my I've got my notes notes in this so it needs to be in a two stream let's get out of the way arrangements mm -hmm. I you probably have to use still use the extended desktop that same problem. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. I can move to yeah, this one. I'll see. I can move to the can switch to here so you can able to see your. Oh, that works. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. Sorry about the uh, the brief interruption there. Um, okay. Okay. So um, yeah. So what's so special about? Oh, I've lost my mouse. Oh, here we go. What's so special about um, clinical text? Um, so imagine you go to um, imagine you go to the clinic. Each visit to the clinic generates a bunch of data. Um, uh, much of it's structured data. Uh, so you have things like coding and billings, uh, patient demographics, so things like age, diagnosis codes, that kind of thing. Uh, you have prescription orders, you have test orders, you have labs, you have imaging data, you have test results. All this is structured or semi-structured data. Um, and examples of semi of structured data are things like uh, these ICD-10 codes. So ICD, International Classification of Disease, um, um, and that's a way of coding diseases and symptoms um, uh, and, and, and structured data in the electronic health record. So some of these are sort of very general, these are just examples, but we have really weirdly specific ones like this as well. So civilian watercraft involved in water transport accident with military watercraft. Yeah, that's kind of an absurdly specific code. Uh, and you can imagine the universe of all events that can happen in the world uh, can't be represented in this way. Um, so um, so the, 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 the structured data is really insufficient for representing what the, what the uh, doctor wants to actually document in the, in, in the, in the record. So that's where um, structured data comes in. So this is an example of a, of a text note. So we have um, a, a new ambition. We have Terence Reeves, who's going in, who's a, uh, who's a, um, um, uh, perhaps it sounds like he's going into a, a, a care home or a care facility. Uh, and Terence, he prefers to be called Terry. Okay. So this, this bit of information is, is unlikely to be represented in structured data. It's, his preferred name is, is likely only going to be in the note, in the text note. Okay. Um, so Terry is 71 years old. So typically the structured data does a pretty good job of representing things like age and address and you know, these demographic variables. Um, but the next sentence, he arrived in facility with wife and daughter. Okay, so this is really important clinical information because it suggests that Terry 
he has he has um, he has some social support, and this is very important clinically. Where to, where where and and deciding on his care plan and so on, it's 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 important information, and it's not represented anywhere in the in the structured data. So the only way to get this kind of information is to um, is 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 to uh, uh, look at the actual clinical note. Um, and similarly, the blood pressure information, this observation taken BP, all that information, um, it's not always represented in the in the um, in the um, in the structured data. Sometimes that's in the clinical note too. Um, so for a lot of these things, we have to go to the note. Okay, now this is just an example scenario. So uh, Sasha Dublin, she's a, a researcher. At Kaiser Permanente, which is the big hospital system in, in, um, in the US, has millions of patients. Uh, and and Sasha, Sasha, Sasha Dublin, she was uh, um, um, she's interested in, in, um, in working out whether patients treated with opioids were more likely to develop pneumonia than patients who aren't treated with, with opioids. Okay. Um, so um, um, what she wanted to do was, she, well, what she needed to do was, was she needed to define a cohort of individuals who'd been treated with opioids. Okay, that's relatively easy with the electronic health records. You could just write a bunch of SQL queries and work that out. Okay, the next stage, when she's when she wants to, de to determine um, uh, which which members of that cohort deter uh, develop pneumonia and which don't. That's a lot more difficult because the the uh, 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 structured data is not very reliable for that. So what she had to do is she had to pay two people uh, to read thousands of chest X-ray reports over two years in order to develop her cohort. Okay, and these two people uh, that she she had to hire, they weren't folks that were hired from from Mechanical Mechanical Turk or a crowdsourcing platform. They they were sort of highly qualified medical professionals, uh, and th this whole process was not inexpensive, and it took a long time. And given that her her real her real aim of doing the study was doing an epidemiological study, uh, it was it, it just slowed the whole thing down. Okay. So you should be able to see here the obvious role of NLP in this kind of project. Um, so you could um, you could develop an NLP system with uh, uh, without having to kind of annotate uh, thousands and thousands of notes. You can maybe just annotate a couple of hundred notes and, and develop an LLP system and, and, and uh, make this whole process a lot more efficient. Okay, so that's one example. So the next bit is a bit more interactive. So I have a handout here. Uh, so... Okay, um, so um, so now I want you to to be an NLP system. Okay, this is this is your this is your um, uh, goal for the next few minutes. So the case I want you to work on relates to biosurveillance. So I think we, after COVID, we all have a rough idea what biosurveillance is. It's you know identifying disease outbreaks or um, uh, uh, illness, uh, uh, large scale illness at early stage. Okay, um, so this this um, this graph you see here is from uh, Pittsburgh, Allegheny County in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And it's a, um, a health surveillance, a biosurveillance system for respiratory illness. Okay. And it, it, it covers a month in, in, in the summer. Okay. Um, and you see on the right hand side of the screen, there's a big peak, very big peak. Um, and so we're interested in, in what that peak is. What's going on with that peak? Is it is it just hay fever? Is it um, is it uh, carbon monoxide poisoning? Is it a new a new variant of a, of, of you know, whatever disease? Is it is it is it is it a poison? Is it is it a is it a, a bioterrorist attack? Whatever it might be. Okay. Um, so, oops. 
So if you're doing biosurveillance and you're looking at respiratory illness, um, use, it, use an NLP system, and you're looking at emergency room reports, then you're probably looking for the following concepts, okay? So we have dyspnea here, which is difficulty breathing. We have tachypnea, which is very rapid breathing, uh, air hunger, it's sometimes called. Uh, we have fever, which we're all familiar with elevated temperature. We have a cervical endinopathy, which is a, a enlarged lymph nodes. I'm, I'm sure we all have the experience of when you go to the doctor, they kind of check your lymph nodes. That's what they're doing uh, there. Uh, and also pneumonia. Uh, so lung infections, uh, which can be viral or bacterial and cause respiratory distress. Um, so what I want you to do now is I just want you to spend a minute just kind of skimming through that, that, uh, that, that, that uh, paper that I've just given you, which is a real de-identified ER report. And just, just, spend a, just spend a minute on that. Because I need to get the handout again. Oh, yeah. A bit more than a minute. <laughs> It is, yeah, yeah. I, I don't see yeah, that's a good point. I don't say that I don't expect you to understand all of this. I don't understand all of this. It's fine. Is, is Mel back? Mm. Oh, okay, it's just going to be a bit longer. Oh, I can see you in the Zoom, Mel. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are we, are we okay to start, Mel? One second. Okay, sorry. I, 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 uh, it's it's because of the people, folks on the Zoom, so they can they can access it. That good. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay. 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 Um, okay. So, um, uh, so you've had a bit of time to read that now. Um, so if you look at the, at the screen here, there's two, there are two sentences or kind of words in sentences that are highlighted related to dyspnea. So what I'd want you, what I would, what I'd like you to do is to tell me whether dyspnea is, a, is, 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 current so is a patient currently experiencing dyspnea is it a historical case of dyspnea so is is it dyspnea for a couple of months from a couple of months back or is it some hypothetical future case of dyspnea so um does anybody have any any suggestions about that just shout out Yep, it's current. Um, that's that's my my understanding as well. It's kind of current or acute. Um, so there's no obvious 
information to the contrary. So we can kind of assume it's current, I think, in this situation. Um, uh, the patients complained about it, the doctors reported it. Um, 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 so if you look at the first example here at the top, at the bottom example, though, you'll, you'll notice that um, um, there are at least two, well, there's actually a whole bunch of different ways of saying dyspnea. I, I mean, well, you can spell it differently as well if you're using the British spelling, which I think you do in Australian, in Australian notes. Um, um, so the, the key thing here is that, is that you need some kind of um, uh, some kind of dictionary, some kind of knowledge resource to represent the synonyms for dyspnea, because you see shortness of breath, SOB, air hunger, all these kind of phrases, uh, and they vary a lot by locality. So that's that's one thing you need. Okay, so second example, tachypnea. Okay, so tachypnea, is it is it present, is it historical, or is it absent? What do you think? So you've got... Yep, yep, I, I, would, I would go with uh, absent too, um, because it says, what is it? He's modestly febrile, neither tachypnea nor tachardic. Uh, so tachardia is kind of rapid, all right. Um, so um, another thing we need in a clinical NLP system is some kind of negation functionality. So, and it, it needs to be reasonably, um, reasonably uh, sophisticated, uh, the, the negation algorithms that we have to use. Um, so does anybody see anything, uh, uh, anything else that might be a bit weird about this sentence? Um, he is modestly febrile, neither tachypnic or tachardic. Is there anything grammatically a bit weird about that? Yep, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It should be neither nor, not neither or. So you need a navigation system that's reasonably robust to it's robust enough to pick up those kind of things and, and process it. Because these aren't these are well written doc in the ER. You know, if you think about the doctor in the ER, in the emergency room, they're in a rush. That uh, it's 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 almost stream of consciousness sometimes. So uh, uh, it's not polished text. Um, okay. So moving on to fever. Um, what do you think about this? Is it is it is fever? Is it present? Is it historical or is it absent? <laughs> Next stage is death, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that 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 was that was that, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so fever here is acute. Um, so modestly, so so we need some kind of system that 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 um uh, that that has that recognizes febrile as an adjective for fever for a start. Um, and I'm glad you I'm glad you noted the uh, modest modestly febrile and temperature of thirty nine point five. There's some contradictory information in in here, uh, and that needs to be resolved at the document level. Um, um, and also, um, I mean, the second example here, temperature is 39.5. So it doesn't explicitly say fever. So you have to understand, A, that's referring to human temperature, uh, not temperature of something else, um, and uh, your general body temperature. And, and then you have to be able to pass out the, uh, uh, the, the, the number. You have to work out whether it's Celsius or Fahrenheit. Um, if, if you're an American, you have to do that. Um, uh, not so much here. Um, uh, and then you have to work out what your threshold is for for um, uh, high temperature. This is clearly sort of very high temperature. It's not modestly febrile at all. What do you think about the bottom one? The, the patient was discharged with antibiotic therapy. Patient should return for increased shortness of breath or recurring fever. What do you think about that one? Is that... Present is it uh, historical? Is it hypothetical? Yeah, it's 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 hypothetical. It's a bit of everything, isn't it? Because uh, recurring could be like currently, it could be past, it could, uh, and it's a reference to the future as well. So it's the temporality of these notes is really quite complicated, and and modeling that is uh, an NLP system. If you're just doing fairly straightforward information extraction, you need to be able to model that. Um, okay, uh, I think this is the last one. Uh, oops, yeah, 
Um, so second to last one. Um, cer cervical adenopathy. What do you think about this one? Does the person have cervical adenopathy? No, 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 yeah, that's right. Um, that's that's what the system would come up with as well. Now this is a bit a bit difficult, isn't it? Because it says adenopathy, but it doesn't say cervical adenopathy. So cervical is kind of Latin for neck, uh, or cervix is Latin for neck. Um, uh, um, but it doesn't explicitly say that. So if you're building a, an NLP system, you need the, uh, to, to identify whether someone has cervical adenopathy. You need to be able to first identify the structure of the note so we've got a physical examination paragraph here it's and it's 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 uh, in several different subsections related to different anatomical locations so you need to be able to to, to pass it out for that um, um you need to identify adenopathy and you need to infer from the subsection that adenopathy refers to cervical adenopathy and then you need to identify if the concept of adenopathy is negated Okay, so there's quite a lot. There's quite there's, there's some complex reasoning in, in, in this. Um, okay. Yeah, this is the last example. Uh, pneumonia. Um, what do you think about this? Is this um, is this present? Is it historical? Is it hypothetical? Yeah, well, I, I, I think I went with acute and historical. Uh, so if you look at the first mention, um, patient has past mention, uh, has past history of pneumonia. Uh, so that's clearly historical, two months ago. It's not an acute reference to an acute illness, although they might have an acute illness. Um, now, the second example is a bit weird because uh, bilateral interstitial pulmonary, pulmonary infiltrates uh, that's something that, that's in a radiology report. Um, it's finding a radiology report, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean the person has pneumonia, as I understand it. I'm not a doctor. Uh, it can be related to other kinds of illnesses as well. But because of the context, you know, they're talking about dyspnea. It's a respiratory, uh, uh, all these symptoms associated with pneumonia. Then there's some kind of inference that it's pneumonia. And if you look at the bottom example, that inference is made explicit. It says um, uh, bilaterally interstitial pneumonia. Okay, so they've, they've kind of closed the loop there with, with the reasoning at the bottom. But they don't always do that. So you have to make these inferences. Okay, so that's that's the that's the uh, that's the, the the mildly interactive part over with now. And, uh, I'm, I'm just going to cover um, some issues with um, uh, uh, related to that, but why, why is clinical NLP challenging? So I'll talk a bit about named entity recognition. Um, I'll talk a bit about uh, contextual attribute assignment, so negation, uncertainty, and temporality. And I'll talk a bit about uh, discourse processing, which is uh, 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 related to the report structure and co-reference. Okay, so uh, a lot of the derivate, a lot of the linguistic variation is pretty easy to do in English. Uh, it's pretty it's relatively simple in English. So derivation, basically, sort of a new part of speech. Uh, I think you pronounce this medius medius stinal medius stinum. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's basically it's a sort of location in the chest. Um, so you can make uh, you can make adjectives from nouns and nouns from adjectives and so on. Uh, and that's fairly. Straightforward. Um, inflection also is pretty straightforward, um, but you need dictionaries to, to represent all these things. Um, um, the really difficult thing is synonymy. Okay, so uh, this is a massive, huge problem when you're dealing with clinical data. So this is an example from uh, Addison's disease, which uh, um, Addison's disease, as I understand it, it relates to um, 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 a, a deficit in, in uh, adrenaline production. Um, um, but there's loads of different ways of saying that. You can say um, adrenal insufficiency, adrenal cortical insufficiency, 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 bronze disease. I've never heard of that. Uh, these are all ways of saying or, or synonyms or near synonyms for uh, uh, Addison's disease. Um, similarly, with with, with uh, concepts like chest wall tenderness, so people can just say chest wall is tender or patient experience in chest wall tenderness, or they can, they can 
And if you go into more nuanced description, like uh, like this one, uh, Tess Wall did demonstrate some slight tenderness. Uh, um, so you need a system. If you're looking for the concept of chest wall tenderness, you need a system that can that can manage all these different situations. Okay. Also, polysemy is a is a is a big issue. Um, so different meanings for the same word. Uh, so patient was prescribed codeine upon discharge. So discharge meaning they left the hospital. The discharge was yellow and purulent. So discharge being a unpleasant excreted thing from the body. Um, um, so you know, obviously the clinical note, if you're if you're looking at symptoms, you need to you need to be be mindful of these these kind of differences. Uh, another big issue, uh, and this is depending on the kind of data that you're working with, it's, it's, it can be a real pain. Um, acronyms and abbreviations. Um, so APC, it can refer to a whole bunch of things. So advanced pancreatic cancer, age period, cohort, alpha, alpha protein concentrate. I have no idea what that is. Um, so um, um, yeah, so you, you need some kind of system that can that can disambiguate between these these, these acronyms, and they vary a lot between between this, between medical specialties. Uh, so you can kind of infer to a certain extent, depending on the medical specialty that you're working with, but they also differ geographically as well. So they'll call things or, or where the person went to medical school. Those these kind of these kind of variables influence the, the particular acronyms and abbreviations that are used. Um, so if you if you um, and also the culture of the hospital. So if if you um, if you look at um, uh, hospital systems that are in the same city, sometimes you know across the street from each other, they'll use different abbreviations in in, in the hospital in the hospital. So any NLP that you develop in one hospital, it won't in a straightforward way. Depending on what you're trying to do, it it won't necessarily work in the in the in the hospital across the street. Um, so this this stuff is a uh, is is very tricky. And this is just some some examples of uh, of spelling errors. Uh, diarrhea is another one that, that always is a big problem. Um, um, uh, but pneumonia is 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 a uh, very pro because of, you know the silent p. Um, and it's estimated that about um, well, I've seen data from Australia saying that three percent of of terms are um, misspelled. Um, other work, uh, a colleague of mine at, at the University of Utah, um, Barb Jones, she, she did a study that estimated that about 10% of, of terms in clinical notes were misspelled. Um, I, I, I think I believe the 10% number or 3% number based on my experience. Um, yeah, so this is, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just an endemic uh, problem with uh, clinical text. Um, that, that no one has quite solved yet. Um, Okay, so um, 140. Um, so contextual attribute assignments. So um, we talked we talked a bit about negation. We talked a little bit about negation. Negation is really important for clinical texts. Um, uh, and, and the reason that, the, that negation is so important is that when a doctor when they write the note, they're not necessarily uh, just descriptively writing what happened, although they are doing that as well to a certain extent. What one of the purposes of the note is to is to is to um, um, describe their thinking process. You know, they're 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 considering hypotheses and they're ruling things out. They have differential diagnosis, but they think this particular diagnosis is unlikely. Uh, so it's really a record of their thought process rather than just as a, a description of the patient's uh, symptoms. Um, so uh, there's this well-known study uh, from 2001, which shows that um, uh, approximately half of all clinical concepts in dictated reports are negated. Now, if you look at some kinds of reports, like radi radiology reports, it's more like two thirds. It's just full of really complex negations. Um, uh, and sometimes these negations are, are really explicit. You know, it's just very clear uh, uh, that um, um, a negation is happening. Sometimes you can infer negations. Um, so there's an implied negation. So this example, uh, uh, lungs are clear upon oscillation. So you can assume from that that, that uh, um, uh, certain signs uh, to do with either the noisy lungs are, are going to be missing. So raunching, squeak, and, and wheezing are going to be absent. Okay. 
Uh, but that's an inference that you're making. So the clinical, the clinical um, uh, NLP system is making these kind of inferences. Uh, let's skip over that. Um, okay, so uncertainty is a big problem as well. Uh, it, um, it's similar to scientific writing in, in that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, tent there are a lot of tentative conclusions and uncertainty in clinical text. So you remember from the pre from the handout I gave you, uh, the the patient was treated for presumptive sinusitis. So this means that the the doctor is going to treat the patient as if they have sinusitis. So their their um, symptoms are consistent with sinusitis. But they don't want to go quite as far as say that they have sinusitis. They, that's that's a bridge too far for them. Um, so that's it's quite subtle uh, the, the way that uncertainty is expressed. Uh, and similarly with clinical reasoning, I, I quite like this example. So it was felt that the patient probably had a cerebrovascular accident involving the left side of the brain. Okay, so no no passive voice there uh, and a disembodied uh, element. Um, other differentials entertained, so he's entertaining these differentials, were, were perhaps seizure and the patient being post-ictal, so that's post-seizure, uh, uh, when he was found, although this consideration is less likely. So that's a very, very nuanced uh, 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 description of, of the doctor's clinical reasoning. Um, yeah, he probably had some kind of cerebrovascular accident, but yeah. Um, so a bit more on uncertainty. Um, so these are just some examples related to Parkinson's disease. So so you have this, you know, you have a spectrum. You have a spectrum from I'm absolutely certain that this patient has a condition or or a diagnosis, or to I'm absolutely sure this patient doesn't have a diagnosis. And there's all these points in between. Uh, so patient has Parkinson's disease. So very clear, very clear statement. Uh, Hundred percent confident. Yeah. Um, physical examination strongly suggests Parkinson's. Uh, so they think they have Parkinson's, but they don't really want to just go out on a limb and, and, and categorically say that. I think the next one is a bit weaker, so possibly positive. Patient possibly has Parkinson's. And then we move up, move over into the, into, the, into the negative side of things where we talk about Parkinson's cannot yet be ruled out, no support for Parkinson's, and Parkinson's could be excluded. So uh, a lot of the findings are along this kind of spectrum, you know, the way it's, it's documented in the, in the, in the note. Uh, so of course, this, this poses challenges for, for NLP systems because you need to be able to identify those nuanced statements. Okay. And temporality is, is really important as well. Uh, so this CHF, that's congestive heart failure. So, you know, if we, if we can identify a history of congestive heart failure um, and um, yeah, um, hypotheticals are very important as well. Um, uh, and also doctors often often um, document the, the sort of the, the temporal course of the disease. So so the patients kind of arc through their, the, through, through the, their story, through their, their illness. So they start off with, in this case, chest pain, they have a, a nitroglycerin administered, and now the chest pain is resolved. So it's a nice story arc for the patient. Um, um, also, uh, discourse processing um, is is a uh, very important. Um, and we touched on that a bit with the neck example that I was talking about. Um, uh, so you need some notion of of of, um, of of discourse structure in the text, and you need some way of sectioning the text into relevant parts because. It, the, the, the notes might look messy, but they do have a very clear implicit structure. Uh, but the difference is, but the, the difficulty is that the structure varies between doctors, so you can't necessarily predict it. You have to you have to work it out on the fly quite a lot. Um, uh, also, some sections are more more important than others. So oftentimes there's an impression section in the note which basically offers a summary. Uh, so you probably want to identify that. Uh, as, as an important piece of information if, you, if you're doing information extraction with this type of text. Um, also uh, with with clinical notes, um, there's quite a lot of copy and pasting, uh, uh, quite a lot of semi-structured data. So um, you need to determine, this is this is endemic, in, I haven't seen this too much in Australia, but, but this is endemic in, uh, in the veterans health system in the United States. There's just loads of this stuff. 
uh, and you have to uh, you have to kind of develop ways to to um, to, to deal with it, either to ignore it, uh, to to recognise what's semi structured and what's narrative, uh, or to actually process process the semi structured data. Um, uh, yeah, so it's 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 challenging. Also got co reference as well. Uh, that's that's an endemic problem. Um, so this example, chest X ray again shows a well circumscribed nodule located in the left upper lobe. The tumor has increased in size since the last exam with a diameter of approximately two centimeters. So how big is a nodule? Yep, two centimeters. Uh, has the module increased? Has a nodule increased in size? Yep, it's increased in size. Um, and where's the tumor? Left up below. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you need some notion of um, of co-reference re re resolution here, and this is actually trickier than it looks because uh, a nodule. Well, a growth, say in the lung, it can take it can begin as a nodule, but when it gets to a certain size, which I think is about two or three centimeters, it becomes a tumor. So, um, um, so you have all these very complex co-reference co-reference problems because it, it kind of has a uh, the, the the growth has a sort of career, and you call it different names at different stages. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's it tr tricky co-reference resolution problems here. Okay. So 148, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, I'll say a bit about the clinical NLP development process. And this is, a lot of this is gonna be familiar to anybody who does, does uh, uh, I guess, more trial to NLP maybe. Um, but in in, um, in clinical NLP, you've got these additional steps. So you, you have often have a de-identification step. Uh, and depending on the situation you're in, this could be huge or it could be small. Um, um, it, it could be very challenging or it can be straightforward depending on the particular environment that you're in. Um, you have finding the right documents. So this is actually really difficult, um, finding the right documents. Before you actually do any NLP, you have to uh, um, uh, you know, find which kind of notes have the information that you need in them. Um, you, you, have to, um, um, you, you have to kind of understand the data. So, so so the recording practices have changed at some point and no one's documented it and you have to kind of reverse engineer that. So there's all that extra stuff you need to do. And then you've got the, um, the, the annotation process, um, you know, which involves defining annotation variables and, and all the stuff you need to do with annotation. But you're doing this typically in a very, very locked down environment uh, because uh, uh, the medical data, often it can't leave the hospital. So you're doing this, you, you go through all this process with, with ancient windows boxes uh with with no uh or, or you know just plain python sort of on there you can't really it, it's difficult to actually do anything with the data um so uh, and and the people you, the, the people you're working with are often clinicians um who maybe aren't kind of optimized for doing that kind of work uh and are very expensive <laughs> um so, um, um, so you got all that to do, and then at the end, you've got you've got the train of the system and evaluate the system. So essentially, most of the effort goes uh, goes on the left hand side. That's the bulk of, of the work, and then the NLP bit is kind of an afterthought at the end, pretty much. I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly, but that that is, it's not that much of an exaggeration. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to say a little bit about corpora as well. Um, so um, clinical text is, is very precious. It's hard to access. Um, there are very few public data sets. I'll mention a couple. Um, and also because um, uh, um, medicine is, is so varied, so there's so many different specialties in medicine, uh, uh, it, it means that um, uh, if you train, it, it, a particular data set might not be suitable for the kind of question that you're, you're, you want to answer. So if you have a data set from, say, uh, that, that uh, um, covers like bipolar disorder, it's psychiatric notes about bipolar disorder, it's not really going to help you if you're trying to predict congestive heart failure. Okay. Um, and there, are, there are some resources for where you can find corpora. There's typically some ethics hoops you need to jump through to access them, but there are, there, there are, there are some resources out there. Um, so this is one um, one. Uh, corpus that is freely available. It's 5,000 notes, empty samples, 
it's kind of sanitized, very clean data. Uh, but it's it, you know if you're interested in this in this kind of in this kind of work, it's a it's an interesting place to, to start out. Uh, there's, there's lots of people have written uh, have produced annotations on top of this, so it's uh, it's it's quite an interesting data set despite its limitations. Um, Mimic the uh, medical informa information mark for intensive care is another resource. Uh, that's a much bigger resource. It's, it's American uh, intensive care unit data. Uh, and it has structured data in as well and various other, not just clinical notes. Um, yeah, again, you need to jump through some hoops. It's not on the open web. You have to jump through some hoops to get hold of this data. Um, and yeah, it has the general, the, the usual uh, uh, clinical note weirdness and uh, um, acronyms that no one knows what they mean. <laughs> um, I'll skip over the knowledge resort. Well, I'll just say a little bit about that. Um, so as, as you probably picked up, knowledge resources are really, really important in clinical NLP uh, because it's, it's, it's a sort of knowledge rich domain and there's a lot of terminology uh, that, 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 are, that we need to work with. So a lot of the time we use external terminologies or ontologies in clinical NLP. Uh, and these have uh, 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 a, a range of, of formality. So you, um, 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 but, um, they are very important for things like uh, concept matching. And I'll say a little bit about that. Um, so historically, probably the most important uh, clinical concept matcher or clinical name entity recognition tool is probably Metamat, uh, which was developed in, originally it was released in 1994. Uh, it came out of the National Library of Medicine in the, in, in the US, uh, part of the NIH, National Institutes of Health. Uh, it's really written in Prolog. Uh, I think the new version, they, they eventually change over to something else, but it's, it can kind of run at a reasonable pace now. But uh, but it's still, it's a really useful resource, uh, and it, it does a pretty good job of, of, uh, of doing concept matching on named entity recognition with clinical text. Um, so that's that's one resource that, that's still, still widely used. Uh, there are a couple of other resources that people use specifically for clinical text. There's this tool called CTAKE, which I think was developed at Harvard. Um, and it's still used for, uh, it's used quite a lot for off the shelf clinical NLP. So if you, if you just need to get something up and running, uh, then people, people use that quite a lot for things like um, common tasks, like whether someone's a smoker or not, you need to determine that with NLP. Um, so uh, other things that are perhaps um, you know more uh, more recent um, are things like MedSpacey, which is uh, built on top of Spacey uh, and has a lot of uh, um, um, functionality specifically related to clinical text. Um, uh, and MedCat, which is a, a tool uh, developed at um, uh, King's College uh, and University College London. Uh, which um, uh, does clinical concept matching pretty well. I mean, I thought I thought it worked pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that's the, that again is a sort of modular, fairly flexible tool and maps to clinical ontologies. Um, so a key, yeah, a key thing emphasize this. A key, a key thing is mapping to clinical ontologies. That, that oftentimes that's the first thing you do when you're doing a clinical NLP project. Um, okay. I just want to say a little bit, I've got a couple of minutes left, so I just want to say a little bit about um, uh, ethics in, in clinical NLP. Um, there's a really nice review paper by uh, Susta et al. from 2017, um, which is from um, um, the workshop of, of ethics in NLP, which, uh, which nicely summarizes this. Um, th there's also um, um, a bunch of... Um, of, of regulate uh, sort of legal issues, not 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 just ethical issues, but actual legal issues around around um, uh, what you can do with with uh, with with clinical text. Um, and in the US, and I think de facto here in Australia as well, people tend to use uh, the the HIPAA. HIPAA is a US Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, DI uh, um, um, uh, protected health information list. So there are eighteen data elements. That you need to remove from from a from a clinical text for it for it to be considered de-identified according to this rule. They're 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 all listed here. They're things like names, dates, addresses, phone numbers, that kind of thing. Um, in Australia.
Australia, my understanding is, is that um, uh, they don't really have this kind of cookbook approach. There's a lot of regulation, but um, they don't ha necessarily have this kind of cookbook approach to deciding whether something can be identified. Um, okay, so I won't go into that too much, but um, you, you'll get the slides afterwards if you're interested. Um, and just finally, I'll say a bit about uh, publications. Um, so um, publications in clinical NLP, um, I'd say most of the work tends to be published in journals. Uh, so journals like uh, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association, Journal of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, it tends to go to there rather than uh, you know the big the big uh, 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 NLP conferences like ACL or NACL. Although they do publish that stuff, it's just very not not that much. Uh, but there are a lot of um, computer science workshops like bio NLP and uh, clinical NLP workshops, CL psych for more mental health stuff that do publish a lot of uh, clinical uh, clinical work, uh, clinical NLP work. Um, and I think um, I think I've come into come to the end of the hour now. So uh, I can find more with this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit about the grant funding thing. So, um, so um, um, the grant funding, I'm, I'm not sure if people are, but you probably will be interested in this at some point, even, you know, if, if, if you're currently working on your PhD, grant funding is kind of an important to everybody, I think, ultimately. Um, so, um, grant funding for this kind of work, um, a lot of it tends to come from um, um, from medical funders. So uh, in the US, that would be places like the National Institutes of Health. Um, I know that the ARC, the Australian Research Council, does fund some of this stuff. Though I've seen, uh, I've, I've seen these um, these these kind of grants funded by by them. Um, but a lot of the money can, seems to come from um, uh, things like the Medical Research Future Fund here in Australia. Um, so. Uh, the grant funding tends to be more on the sort of applied medical side. Uh, I think it's fair to say. Um, as I've got a couple of extra minutes, I will I will talk a bit more about the uh, the, the ethics piece. Um, so um, there are sort of several ethics issues uh, with clinical clinical text that it's probably just worth having it at the back of your mind. So the first relates to security. Um, so, um, 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 so typically, clinical text it has to be it has to be stored in a very secure environment. Typically, it doesn't leave, or oftentimes, it doesn't leave the actual the, 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 the hospital it was generated at or the health system it was generated at. So, as, as I as I mentioned before, the um, if, if you're working on the text, oftentimes uh, you're working on a on servers that really weren't designed for research. So, there's, there's certainly no GPUs. Available for this kind of for in, in those kind of environments, and oftentimes um, uh, you you get a situation where um, uh, so if people do know I know this is how it works in the NHS in the UK that uh, people's offices are actually in the NHS, uh, and that's where they you know that's where that's how they get around the the the, the, the data access issues. Um, so privacy, of course, is a is, is a big uh, big issue. Um, um, so privacy, confidentiality, they tend to kind of rub together. So privacy is about persons and confidentiality is about data, typically. Um, so privacy is about the extent to which we allow access to ourselves, uh, so aspects of our lives and so on. Confidentially is confidentiality is 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 you know about how data that I've disclosed is 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 correct. And both these things are really important. Um, so um uh so, so typically, um, uh, the, the the eighteen HIPAA PHI data classes that that, that, that I mentioned that should be removed uh, from from uh, clinical data, clinical notes, that's nowhere near sufficient to to uh, ensure that it's actually private. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so even even if you kind of go through go go through the hoops of a uh, of of, of I've go through the PHI the identification process. The data still has to has to be locked down. Uh, basically, it's very very difficult to share this data. It's um, yeah. Um, so one way of increasing the volume of data available that we can work that we can work with is is using consent models, um, and that's where you know like you have a donor card or 
people have donor cards uh, where they where they uh, consent to 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 to, to uh, organ donation. Similar to that, you kind of opt in to having to having your data used for research. Um, that has obvious problems about bias, though, because uh, the kind of people who have their who 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 are who are fine with having their data used for for research maybe not not be representative of the public as a whole. Um, so you got these kind of subtle bias problems. Um, also, sort of a different sense of bias. Um, if we're developing NLP based on existing notes, we're going to have a we're going to have um, um, we're we're we're, we're we're, going, we're, we're just going to amplify existing bias that's already in, in, in the notes. So if we have, uh, say, um, uh, um, notes that, that exist in medical practices that discriminate against particular groups, then if we, if we, um, if we you know, train models on, on, on the, that, that kind of data, then we're just going to amplify that. So uh, they're, they're all issues to consider. Um, um, similar to synthetic data as well. Um, a big issue is dual use. So um, this is my final point, I'll just finish off with this. Uh, so dual use, um, and that's common to, to all technologies, I think, but it's, it's, it's especially um, uh, insidious, I think, you know, in, in, in clinical data, because um, um, it, people are especially vulnerable in that area. So you might have a um, um, you might develop this, this wonderful uh, um, uh, clinical NLP al algorithm that can Identify people who are at risk of um, of substance use, for example, or risk of, um, of developing schizophrenia. Okay, um, and that's great if you can intervene early and help people with their consent. That's that's a wonderful thing. But if if that's used to identify uh, people who who are going to be very expensive for insurance companies in the future, uh, then that's a much less desirable situation. Okay, so it's dual use, true of all technology, but especially true with clinical tests. Um, yeah, so I think I've used my extra minutes now. <laughs> so I'll finish there. We'll have, say, five minutes for questions because we're running out of time. Um, you can fill out on my phone. Right? But anyone have any questions, um, raise your hand and I'll talk about you. First of all, thank you for the great uh, presentation and tutorial. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when I was learning English, one of the things that they told us first is that they, they because of the influence of the Latin things, there were two ways of saying one thing based on something specialized, something more vernacular. So, for example, Rome and Japan go up. Yep. And being a Spanish speaker, the specialized one was always easier. But uh, they told us that it is only, it wouldn't sound weird if I use very specialized vernacular. So in the example that you gave, uh, there is a case, uh, the one that you mentioned, where they use a specialized term, but at the end they use a more, you know, vernacular or more familiar one, which is the short breath and return to fever. So my question is, in uh, those analyses, do you take into account the social linguistics of that? For example, I noticed at the end, the person doing the report is kind of relaxing more. Because is it more that what the person is going to tell the patients to do this? So that's why the, the vocabulary is not as complex. And also, I noticed something that uh, in the middle text, if they don't use the four patients as, as a subject, a sentence that is subject linguistically, but use them at the beginning and the end. So, is, is it how do you deal with people like writing a report, but like targeting different audiences? And how, how is that complexity? Uh, I don't know, approach in NLP. Um, yeah, oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the answer to that. I think things might have changed now that patients have more access to their records. I think that might have changed how people write, write, write notes uh, because the, you know there's a reasonable chance that the person is going to be able to actually read the note afterwards. So that encourages the the uh, physician to use you know more vernacular terms, I suppose. Um, or more easily interpretable terms. Um, they're using different terms at different points in the document. That's, that's interesting. I haven't really thought about that too much. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't have a great answer to that, I'm afraid. <laughs> but it's certainly interesting. Yeah, I think we have time for
Um, yeah, yeah, we, we, we sectioning is very important. So identifying different sections of the note is very important. Um, and um, uh, so that's, that's something that's typically done first, first of all. So, um, so there's typically a summary and, you know, a, a physical exam and identifying those sections is very, they're written in different ways as well. Um, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other one more questions? Um, if you could introduce us to the name. Thank you. It's David from Uni. Oh. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, an answer to that. Uh, so I think sometimes we write different things. Uh, sometimes. It's easier the language at the end or sort of a, a final diagnosis to to help the GP when it comes from the hospital to communicate. I think that's a, a good understanding of the public structure. I'm wondering more about you mentioned that uh, the data of medical data is very siloed in hospitals or hospitals like or some. We are in the LLM era. We have these very large language models. How do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile the need to use GPUs uh, with points in the hospital? Yeah, we, we haven't. Uh, well, Jing is going to be talking a bit about, about it later. But um, yeah, clinical NLP is kind of its own beast. It's, it's, it's off from the 